Hello, good morning. A wonderful time of day for you, wherever that might be. Now, I'm hoping this is the second video that one might be seeing of me. In fact, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that most people see a video beyond this one of me as the first video to uh, explain or share more of what it is that uh, you may have come along to find out what I'm talking about is actually about. Now, I'm going to avoid talking about implementation and infrastructure. Um, more so, and begin with starting with talking about the concept of happiness and what happens when we build from the ground up to support a human being on their individualised journey, if you will. And it's fair to say we all have a different, a different objective outcome. It's sort of the natural words that want to come to me. I, I don't feel that's right, but it, it's true to say that I, I'm just one person. I can't understand every, every concept uh, as good as a specialist in any given field would. Um, so when I talk about the, the things that I feel and think, I, I'd like to make sure that people understand that this isn't necessarily the way that things need be implemented. I'll talk about things in, in black and white because the human brain is dualistic. We, we experience cold because of hot, we experience light because of dark. Uh, but the world doesn't operate in that way. I think the world is holistic. Uh, the universe certainly is, is a whole and, and everything that operates in it isn't left and right hemisphere brain necessarily. Uh, so look, I've obviously got the limitations of, of my perception, my understanding and uh, my cultural biases, all sorts of things. It's fair to say that everybody's journey in life is going to be different. So knowing that the journey itself isn't what we're going to support them on, Arguably it is, by giving them a good foundation. Um, that's the concept. Now, I, I quote here, it's, it's loose, it's old psychology, it's the 70s. It's Abraham Maslow, and he talks about uh, the actualized human being. He's, he's a branch of hum the humanism, so hum humanists, and they're really positive. And in terms of the branches of psychology, the humanists are pretty fun. They're, they're the ones that make you feel, yay! And Maslow talked about the hierarchy of needs and spoke about the basis that when we get our base needs met, be it things like shelter and food, um, even love, arguably, that we're, we're working up a hierarchy where our, our, our interpersonal needs, our, our basic needs, not even our interpersonal needs, our personal needs are met, that we are then in our best position to operate as a human being. So when we look at the concept of, of a paradigm shift or, or building from the ground up, to do, um, I mean, the original Industrial Revolution concept was that people would work less hours and be paid more. And obviously everyone, either through needing a cut of their money or the way things worked out, that never really happened. We actually found by the mid-19, mid-20th century, people working longer hours and arguably receiving less remuneration for the amount of time they were spending away from their loved ones or the things that they would actually choose to do if, uh, if they weren't trying to pay for the basic things like food and you know safe structures to live in away from the elements so when we look at nurturing a person as a whole and freeing them up to engage to the best that they can be society really changes because we, we've never had a society that supports people we usually have stigmas associated along the way and and everybody trying to cut everybody down usually because of their own fears to see a world where we're going to live differently. We actually need to be living in that world to see that world for the way it's going to operate. And obviously none of us are in that place yet. We're all operating from a base of fear. What are we going to lose? What are we, what are we giving up? Because that's always been how we've, we've been raised. You know, it's, it's like, oh, wow, there's that, that slice of birthday cake I'm now giving away to one of my friends. There's, there's less cake for me to eat, right? And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not into birthday cakes. Um, probably don't really celebrate birthdays much either, but that's, that's just my personal predilection and so obviously I, I wouldn't feel that I would need to be in a world where I would elect in my office to um, give me cake but the concept of, of what I'm talking about going forward that the main reason why it becomes strong and the main reason why it's perceptually a shift towards happiness is that at the moment people often work jobs that they don't really wish to do some people do and, and those people are champions that they've actually gone out and they've, they've manifested or they've followed their own heart 
in such a way that they, or they've trained their brain to find absolutely enjoyment in doing a typical rigmarole that many a job can have. That, that is, nobody in school aspires to be a bookkeeper, necessarily. You know, we know it's good income. You know, um, arguably doctors and lawyers have a certain amount of, uh, there's a societal feedback there where you've, you've climbed, you know, into, you must be intellectually a better person because you're clearly smart. These, these were hard degrees at university to get into. But that's not true. Universities shape the difficulty of getting into a degree based on what the population needs in terms of roles any given year. I believe when I left school, um, the teaching UAI was actually one of the easier ones to get into. But within a few years, we needed nurses and, and nursing had actually eased up and come down as about a significant amount on the, the requirements to get into, whereas teaching had actually gone right up. And that's one of the ways in which society correctly, arguably manages who does what, how many people we have doing any given thing. You know, it's, there's so many ways in which the current structure works that we've become immune to because we've lived inside of it for so long. But when we actually understand a society built from the ground up to, I can't say combat these things, because it, it's, I guess it, we don't want to just be reactionary and go, oh, look, we've been running this direction for a long time and that's not working, now we're going to go this way. It's, it's, it's not that. We're going to build from the, the ground up with, it, with a different uh, modus operandi in place, if you wish. And it's things like, I mean, I've made a lot of mention about using technology, but uh, I believe the concept is to use technology in order to take as much technology possible out of our lives because it doesn't necessarily bring happiness and, and nor arguably does money. Money does in that money is a veritable solution to many of life's issues, you know, and especially if say your stresses are, I haven't paid my bills, pff, money, done, you know, but if your stresses are, this is, look, look, I, I, I won't even begin. Look, <laughs> let's just acknowledge that we can buy our ways out of a lot of tricky situations and things that cause us discomfort. And humans generally wish to move away from discomfort. And so in that regard, very empowering. But it, it doesn't truly bring happiness. And I, and I say this from the perspective of a lot of people I know that have access to large amounts of money certainly have never proven to be any happier than the next person. And so really it's a state of mind. And what we need to do is to nurture that state of mind. And we need to do it from the ground up. And so where I mention... Um, for example, the notion of what, I, what I'm going to pitch, the main reason it, it goes forward and um, successfully works is that the basic premise is that at the moment, quite often a few people can hold society back. Now, I've been in a country where we've, we've hovered often between 5% and 10% unemployment. And that means that when there's 10% unemployment, we, we perceive it just, again, through a dualistic, we look, oh, instantly, 90% of the people that are carrying the weight of the 10%. Well, probably not, you know, because when, when they quote you 10% unemployment, we're not acknowledging um, an aged population that may have retired. Uh, we're not, not acknowledging um, a lot of people who are in a position where they can't or do, do not feel that they can contribute uh, meaningfully. And that often comes down to the, the rules or rigmaroles of what is a workforce, uh, what is a workplace position. And so usually... Your governments protect different market sectors. So, for example, when we insist that a staff member be paid a minimum three-hour wage, uh, that protects the staff member, arguably. It makes it so that if they're going to go to time to put a uniform on and, and turn up to a workplace, they're going to get remunerated a certain amount of money to make it worth their while. Uh, but it, when, when we start to strip away our current system and, and look at ways where we could be more engaged... Um, and by engaged, I mean if we could take not maybe a hundred percent, because there might be people who legitimately just can't give back. Okay, and I'm, I'm thinking here, hospital beds. You know, if you've got a wing of people in a hospital, there's probably not a lot they can do. Well, again, current paradigm. So what happens if you have the ability to qualify people's capabilities? For example, I'm capable of opening doors, right? And I can I can do a brief course, and somebody can watch me do it. And they can tick off, yep, that person can, can open doors. If I'm then allowed to, as one of my given give back to society roles, is to, to do that, um, just maybe as a concierge, hey, hey, there you go, coming through. Um, and and that sounds to me like a luxury role. I, I, to me, it seems redundant. But uh, again, you know, working from my lens, there might be people out there that, um, for whatever reason, choose not to be able to open doors. And they just want to, you know, walk by in life. Maybe they're professional jugglers just practicing and they, they just want to, um, 
you know, commit to just juggling 20 hours a day and, uh, and, and just maybe don't want to risk the pushing on a door. Anyway, I, I can't, I, I will never understand everybody's motivations and I never want to have to, but I'm also not going to be the person who's um, setting this up. It's going to be, everything's going to be done in a way that works out correctly. And there's a lot of ways we can do to litmus test, as I've always, as I've been suggesting, is that uh, we, we roll out a trial and we, we sharpen the edge, sharpen our pencils as need be, to, um, to make it a better model over time. Um, and, and not a lot of time, but uh, you know, may, maybe a bit like, uh, I think Fallout's a video game where it concepts that uh, there's lots of different bunkers, and that every different bunker was like a different psychological experiment. It might just be in, in certain countries, uh, in an initial rollout where people are quite willing to um, jump ahead if you wish and use whatever bare bones skeleton model we've got in place and to also test a few methods of implementation that uh, and, and basically we'll always be measuring its happiness you know how's that working out for us um, and remuneration are we generating money you know so but less weight on that because once we realize that we've actually got enough money to get by on in fact if, if a person could contribute not eight hours a day for a small part of their life or 15 hours a day as the modern two-parent household might have to be when they've got several children and are trying to do well by them to set them up with a the future therefore multiple properties and, and you know paying off all their mortgages the amount of hours that the average person's having to work is, is ridiculous but if we extend the, the working life of a person beyond what is the present retirement age, and in my country alone, the retirement age keeps getting pushed back. And I think this is a response to the notion that our elderly are living longer. Um, and they are, which is a good thing. I mean, I think it's wonderful. And it's about quality of life. And I think uh, as long as we're improving the quality of life and, and more time with an increased quality of life, to me, that sounds like a win. Um, so. If we could work in such a way that any given part of a day, some of our training is potentially paid, um, certainly towards setting us up, you know, that the, in terms of generating a, a, a negative balance upon our birth, which is essentially what we're doing. If, if, if society is going to prop us up um, on the good faith that we're eventually going to contribute, then it would be nice to think that we're contributing eh, even potentially earlier. I mean, I don't know how many families out there have their less than double digit aged children helping put pamphlets in letterboxes. But when I, I, in the 80s, that was, that was pretty standard affair. Um, in fact, I, very fortunately, I, I grew up in lovely communities and communities in, in capital cities, don't get me wrong, not, not crazy, um, we live alternative and off the radar type, type communities. Although for a different viewpoint, I can imagine that would be very helpful and very nurturing and probably supporting of the heart in a way that people that have lived in those sectors would probably regret coming to the big city and becoming a faceless person in a big crowd. Um, but in, great, in, in big cities, we, we always find ourselves in smaller communities. We, we usually find like-minded people either through our hobby groups or, um, or, or our respective social groups. And, uh, in, and having that luxury, having that benefit or blessing, if you will, in my early life to have stayed over at friends' houses overnight and then finding myself getting up at the 4 a.m. hour of the morning and going down the local news agency and you know, getting everything, these things cut up and put into the cars and, and running out. And I've actually gone to other friends' houses where five children, all in, in high school age or less, are all at night time um, assembling various pamphlets together in such a way that when they go out the next day, their time is more efficient in that they're putting multiple uh, pamphlets, if you will, into each letterbox and therefore actually nearly earning a cent or actual, what might be considered real currency, almost per, per 10 seconds of engagement if you wish. Um, so, you know, get, getting back to what I was saying is, is if we revolutionise things a little bit you know, and move towards happiness, if, if we're able to work less, arguably, how is it in that we're working less? Well, it comes down to what if somebody could already pre-fold you those pamphlets? What if somebody could uh, do the steps that you don't necessarily want to dedicate a lot of your time to, yet somebody else out there who doesn't feel qualified to be a heart surgeon or a, you know, a, trying to think a crane operator perhaps. So, something that might regard uh, aspects of technicality that might take a few weeks of course to get there, right? So today, I don't know to do much. I can open doors, right? So I say, look, um, okay, I see this here that it's suggested at this particular stage in, in, in my life that uh, I should be putting in this many hours uh, of work, say, say, it's estimated, say, four hours a day. 
Um, and so I do. I, for, for one hour a day, I might do that. For a little bit of time, I might do further studies to improve my capabilities towards what I can do for the greater mass. And the reward structures there, again, in terms of the value of an hour of learning might be tiered based on what roles do we need. You know, right, right now we need lots of people who can juggle, for example. And so all of a sudden, the, uh, the arguably the training wage that's being offered each day in terms of being a juggler is um, incrementally more in such a way that we, we kind of flow the people that are on the fence about, oh, I don't know what I should be doing next. Uh, and again, it would be a, most things can be, can be temporary, such that we, we end up, I would imagine, after a block of time, you know, no units of measure here, we might have several skills. We might have, over the hours that we wish to give in work in any given time, in any given day, we might elect to open doors for an hour, to juggle for two hours, and uh, to study for an hour. Um, there might be times in life where we wish to shuffle that up and study for three hours and only work for one. Now, obviously, when we're studying, we're not really giving back, but we are giving back in a future capacity. Now, the current world is set up that we've got to make our money off the people every step of the way. So it's actually really hard for a student to get by, and especially when you're a student and you just want to fill your mind with knowledge, having to do the some of the worst paying jobs out there because you generally haven't got a skill set. It's a hard life. Now those people do turn it around. Usually when they're leaving university and they've got a stacked up amount of debt against their name that other people would have used as a deposit to get down on a house and might be um, earning less in the course of life but eventually getting rewarded back. You know, there's many paths to the summit in the modern world. But what if we could take the best of those paths and offer them to everybody, but arguably do it full well in the front knowing that they're going to they're gonna give us something back. Now, I'm not saying that we don't have a system in place that we we don't have a feedback loop where we go, look, this, this person's wanting to live in a mansion and not really earning much. Now, see, the value of that person then to the society is lessening off. Now, that essentially means that they've got more of an accrued debt internally that they need to remunerate, they need to exchange back. So, look, I'd, I'd like to believe that the cost of anybody's life is eligible for a mansion. Um, but in terms of the fit and finish of that mansion, I'd also like to think that um, the best arts and craftsmen, when they maybe if you like making balustrades, you know, and if, if you just want to give eight hours a day making balustrades, well, in my eyes, you're giving back way more than uh, you might be asking for. And you, you might ask to live in a very simple dwelling. You might actually want to live in essentially like an um, apartment type living, which is obviously very cheap impl implementation. Um, you're essentially earning more than you're withdrawing from the piggy bank. So you're putting more in than, than you're taking out. Now, I would like to think that, that there would be um, aspects of dwelling that would support, uh, if, if you chose to spend more of your life's income on dwelling and you want the, uh, the high socio-economic status type abode that the modern world has, or you just want to live in something with, with lots of space because that's your personal preference. Maybe you want more timber features, um, you know, that is, that's your elective and, and you can go through life living that way. And believe it or not, it all comes out in the wash. It does when we've got mathematicians going, hey, we don't need to make so much money off this person when they're 16 and we don't need to make them work a job that they're probably, um, especially given that they're trying to train their brains as the typical teenager might be when they're, they're working a job at a fast food venue and yet doing a, a medical degree or something that's, you know, or some, whatever is needed, counselling, to revolutionise the world. Um, they, I think, I think we set people up every step of the way to be happier. Now, for starters, I've always been told that, that trust isn't something that you need to make somebody earn from. Trust is something that you give and let other people live up to the expectations. And I'm going to work this in the universe for a second. I believe we have to do that because when we set our goal of that person needs to earn my trust, we, we sometimes forget to check back uh, in and see, well, have they earned my trust yet? And because we've conditioned ourselves to live in a state of not trusting that person, we then create a, a middle tier down the track where we've actually got a transition from trying to remember to trust them before we ultimately then do trust them. So if we could live in a healthy society where people didn't need to lie to get along, um, I, I can see uh, so many ways in which a healthier environment starts, starts to come about. But uh, with regards to giving trust, um, when, when we inherently give it, when, when we meet somebody that looks us up rather than looks down their nose at us, 
What is the effect of that on you? How do you feel when a complete stranger treats you like they're a family member, practically willing to give you the keys to their house? Well, you, you see, personally, and I, I come from a soft background, I've, I've, I've certainly hung out in some very soft circles, that you would think, oh my Lord, <laughs> what's going on here? Um, and, and that's the natural thing in the present paradigm is that we, we want to distrust. That dualistic nature is we've got to protect ourselves. And uh, I think we need to ameliorate our barriers. And we can only really do that in a, in a, in a qualified, safe society. And so how do we qualify a safe society? Well, that, that to me sounds like the challenge. Um, and I, I can imagine there's going to be a lot of people that, that are going to want to form groups further away from the mainstream and, and I mean I've probably given some ideas already in that I've said that it's going to be a uh, like I would like to use a monorail system because of the lack of environmental wear and tear like for example I, I'd like to think less roads are needed um, because roads are a heavy infrastructure and a taxation burden on a country um, that if we for the small distances we needed to travel outside of mass transport and the support of our local suburb well, on the basis that we're all living in um, so, so generally societal structures are, you look at the value of a suburb based on the infrastructure around it, but if you build your infrastructure north or south of a middle line, which is say for example a monorail, and make everything very, very fast to travel, say in my country it would be east-west I would imagine, um, and then your north-south line for living, well, the direction, of the, the, the direction doesn't matter, I guess it's just the concept, it's that you've got... Um, a, a fast transport line may be going one way. So we don't all need the big mall every other day. Um, that might be for, for shopping when we go for things that our local shops don't have to carry. Um, but our local shops might need to supply us things like our milk and our bread and our, our daily consumption devices, um, products. So when we, when we look at a better environment to live in, the notion of building suburbs from the ground up to suit the purpose, the ultimate purpose which they're going to do, which is of course to lower the cost of living and to raise the, the capability towards happiness in our, in our society. Uh, my apologies, I have a window open to, to my road out the front and that's the, the sunrise time of day and uh, if I look distracted it's not, I'm just possibly a highly nervous character in front of cameras and I, I believe, I did get a chance to watch my video after publishing yesterday and uh, I can see uh, where I can normally hold a train of thought on an important topic as needed pretty pretty well put me in front of a camera and uh, look and I'm not working off scripts right now and that, that's the number one thing is I'm not working off scripts uh, look, none of this dialogue is written to psychologically be powerful you know I'm not using uh, specific words or um, pacing or tone of voice to, to push people to an outcome and that doesn't make me a good advertiser and it certainly doesn't give anybody reason to think that if you put me up against the juggernauts that are a big business, that um, their teams of people could disseminate me so quickly. They could. Their, their advertising would be better and uh, it would be very easy to take a lot of cut and paste from even the, the first video. Um, and, and, you know, I ch please, by so somebody do it and um, you know, put, put some music behind it. And, uh, and, and you know, I, no, notoriety of me, look, uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity, they say, and if people are going to come back to the source material... Then, uh, then that's great. And then if people choose to then educate themselves as to what was this all about or what was the motivation, um, then that, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm willing to take it. You know, now, I'm not a comedian by nature, but I, I watch if a comedian's on, on camera, their willingness to turn the lens on themselves and, and be derogatory or to, um, to, to let people have that laugh out loud moment, usually through reflection on themselves and a difficulty in life, I think that's a fantastic capability. And... Uh, and I think we all probably need to generate that, that slightly thicker skin because uh, it's usually the thin skin comes when we live um, usually without happiness and we're in a state of fear. And uh, look, again, these paradigms, when we pick up the psych textbooks and we look at the potential way um, in which we can be happy and what that then equates to versus when you look at the current world that we've all just lived in and it, it has, the world itself has been tightening its belts on us for so long that... I think a lot of people are getting to being at snap, snapping point. And, and this is even before n real, n uh, leading up to 2012, okay? So anyone with a short term memory, with, um, not, not reflecting back on our, our immediate past, might remember, I think the, the Mayan calendar was sort of stopped functioning around about 2012. And, and a mathematician broke it down. Uh, they, they actually went on to say that it was just the base unit with which they worked and, and that you'd, 
when you work to a certain, uh, like, it's like when we count to a thousand. Why do we count to a thousand? We count to a thousand because they're in a base 10 system. That's just the number that, that looks as a significant next change. And my understanding of the, May, of the Mayan calendar and why they stopped dating was that their number system essentially worked out from where it started. That was just the date where they bothered to stop. And if you look at your own calendar on the wall, why is there only 12 months in it? You know, well, it's because we set the, the annual periods in which we try to keep people motivated to operate in um, at annually. Um, yeah, I, I love 16 month calendars myself because I like being able to buy them on clearance. Um, sometimes a couple of months after the new year has begun and, and I'm still getting uh, relatively good value, certainly for the money outlaid. Um, but uh, look, I digress and I'm, I'm not as funny as I wish to be and my apologies if I do try to intersperse with humour. Uh, look, I, I know that my potential audience, potential audience is massive, but the people that stick with me might like a little mixture of lightheartedness. Um, some people might just want me to fall flat on my face and go, wow, what is this guy just blathering about? And they watch me out of the fascination of, of what random thing is he going to jump to next? Well, I, I want to be that person. I want to be something for everybody, if you will, uh, but only because I'm, I'm just trying to get a ball rolling. Now, um, I am trying to get a ball rolling, and, uh, and I've alluded a little bit today about um, potential happiness. So I'd like to stay to this thread, and as much as I really want to go on and answer some immediate questions I no doubt have, uh, no doubt have in my mind that, that people want addressed, uh, look, I'm, I guess my commitment with this video is to show that there is a pace to these videos. There is, um, there, there is a delay, I guess, in my infrastructure in terms of getting them out. Um, I'm at the mercy of, at the moment, my screen for which I'm recording on, I can't see. You know, I'm, I'm at the random luck of, did I line the camera up? Um, is the focus working? Um, look, those things don't really matter. You know, at the end of the day, I have faith these videos will get better instantly. As, as soon as I'm in, at any level backed, you know, okay, what do you mean at any level backed? No, I don't want to mention money for me in the short term versus concepts that matter in the long term. So let's stick to threads. And even though you might be like, hey, on this video, he's not addressing what I want him to address. Eh, I slip in little, little excitation points here and there where I illuminate potential uh, aspects of what I feel are needed. And uh, I'm not trying to create a jigsaw puzzle and I'm not trying to be scattered. Uh, but I realize there's so many base concepts that need to be addressed when discussing a greater concept as a whole so that we don't see the greater concept again through the, the lens that we um, we typically see the world in, which is, is going to be based from protecting ourselves in a, a fear-based paradigm that uh, has definitely shifted. Uh, and this is where I was redressing um, 2012 as the, the last big time when everyone in society was really scared. And before that, it was uh, year 2000. You know, we, we obviously, the Y2K, um, we had legitimate reason potentially for fear. And I say this as an IT person. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. It was a short-sighted thing to only use the last two digits of dates. And uh, actually, I've, I've seen some technology go a little bit too far in the opposite direction. Nowadays, I see some preemptive stuff in place that it's like, well, that's, that's kind of hopeful um, in terms of, yeah, it'd be nice to think humanity's going to get there. Um, so, so look, let's, let's work towards the goal of humanity is going to get there. And where is there? Well, I'd like to think there is um, not a society filled with people with fears um, based on the fact that they'll never earn enough money or that they'll, they'll never be able to provide enough for their kin, um, that they're not living up to a, an expectation that's been programmed into them by their elders, that they're maybe not giving enough back. Um, look, and, and I think, and again, going back to the concept of why my pitch, which hopefully will be the next video, um, will work, is that when you take the present populations where we haven't got everybody doing something, it actually means that the amount of work that needs to be done by the people who are the worker bees actually becomes more. And especially when we consider that everybody needs to take a slice of the pie out of the, the wages that are earned and the roads need to be built and the, you know, the, the infrastructure rollouts need to be upgraded and certain things need to be maintained and, and the governing body needs to be paid their little um, tithe. Um, every, everything cuts into the point where the people who are actually doing all the work are probably looking at the redundant few and going, look, man, you guys are really holding me back, or, or you guys, you know, you people, are making me work longer hours and I'm having to work a hard job and, and I might not like my job, you know, and that, that's my personal grievance because everybody's treating me poorly like I'm a dangerous stranger because on the bus, you know, my facial mask fell off for a second and everybody's like, ah, he coughed. And I mean, oh my Lord, how polite is it socially? Now, if you cough, saying smokers cough, you know, and, and I see it, the smokers out there, like they cough, and, and as soon as they say smokers cough, ah, oh, you see the, the tension in everyone's shoulders just ease off a bit. They go, ah, oh, good, you know, but we're all so fearful. 
of each other. And the crazy thing is we're actually fearful of other people who are working just as hard and doing just as much, uh, living in the same societal structure and having all the same limitations placed on them and having all the same constraints where they're probably not able to feel as happy. And we're all busy looking at each other and we're not looking at where the problems lie. And that's because the problems have a really good job of either being pushed out of the periphery of our, our, our fear-based mind where we go, no, that's just too much to think about. And so, so some problems we, we, we push over consciously or unconsciously and other problems we are hidden from us and, and they're, they're, sub, they're, sub, we're, they're covert. Um, they're, they're, overt is when it's obvious and open and we can all see it and we don't usually hear the word overt very, very much. We do hear covert. Covert sounds great. And spies and you know, great, great uh, movies from, from the time when I grew up. You know, you, you've got to have your a covert agent. Um, but in the modern world, there's so much that it's, it's covert. And we argue that it's to protect business interests and we argue all sorts of things. But uh, in a society where we're working towards happiness, full disclosure is actually an incredible thing. And I've always found every workplace I've worked that if an error is made, the freedom to actually walk up to your next in line and say, hey, I made this error, is such a freeing thing. And, and to maintain a lie or to maintain an issue is, um, is hard work. And so we actually free the entire system up when we can all be accountable and we can all um, push forward. And uh, look, only because I feel I've, I've probably been recording for a fair amount of time and, and my household is starting to wake up, I'm going to exit from this video um, and I'm going to wish everybody well and I'll come back with you as soon as the next drop hits.